Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're gonna to take a look at a very important issue and that is of migration. We're gonna look at some of the trends and what's going on around the world. My guest today is an expert in this area. Ms. Michelle Layton is the chief of the United Nations International Labor Organization office. Ms. Layton, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you very much, Bill. It's nice to be here. I appreciate you being with me today. We're gonna to get into migration, which is an extremely important topic, but let's talk just for a moment or two about the International Labor Organization. You were formed in 1919, right after World War I. You're, as I understand it, the third oldest of the United Nations agencies. What is the main mission of the International Labor Organization, commonly called ILO? Well, that uh, is something that uh, we're very proud of. We're going to be 100 years old this mm -hmm. year. And in fact, we were created by the Versailles Treaty, as you say, in 1919, really under the principle that if you want peace and security, you really need to deliver social justice and protection of, of people mm -hmm. in their workplace, ensure they have access to adequate livelihoods and social protection. And that required uh, the creation of the International Labor Organization. So we're very proud of the fact that this organization is, has uh, really a very uh, large and, um, and deep history in social mm -hmm. justice. Mm -hmm. And those are very important issues to cover. Now, the website for ILO is www.ilo.org, so our viewers can go to that to get further information. Okay. Now you head up the migration department in the ILO. What, what is your responsibility, or the, the migration department, what does it do? Well, we have uh, teams all over the world and I oversee a team that helps provide research, policy advice, capacity building and training for governments and our constituents. We are a tripartite organization, so we have governments, 187 member states, and employers and workers organizations, that is business and trade unions. So we provide advisory services and capacity building and research that helps them ensure proper labor migration governance. And so we're working all over the world and have offices in, in many different countries. Mm -hmm. And our viewers for another website, they can go to www.ilo backslash migration and get more information on this. Now you deal with so many different types of studies, reports, you have the ILO constitution, but there's one thing that caught my attention, the mm -hmm. fair migration agenda. What exactly is the fair migration agenda? Well, it really is about protecting migrant workers. Migrant workers are some of the most discriminated against. They're often in vulnerable situations. They may pay high recruitment fees uh, for their jobs that put them in risk of human trafficking or debt bondage that ensure that they are uh, tied to their jobs. They may not have access to protection. They may feel they can't complain because they fear of deportation. So the fair migration agenda really is about creating the governance necessary to protect their rights in the workplace, those who are looking for work or access to work, equality of treatment, avoiding discrimination, and ensuring that they have opportunities for advancement, just like all workers. Mm -hmm. And so you look at these issues, you look at the migratory patterns, and you work mostly with governments, is that how you do it? Let's, let's just take a specific example. The Rohingyas are on the move. They've been moving, uh, folks have been fleeing Syria. How, how does your office interact with, uh, uh, well, focusing the spotlight on those two groups, let's say? Sure, that's a very good question. We work with all those who are migrant workers, refugees, or forcibly displaced persons mm -hmm. who are uh, seeking to have livelihoods. Often they're not allowed to work in the workplace or forced into the informal economy or underground or have to take irregular or dangerous pathways to get their jobs. So what we do is provide services to the governments and to our employers and workers organizations mm -hmm. to really look at solutions to help address the problems that they face with such large movements. Sometimes there are mixed migration flows, refugees and migrants moving together like those who've gone from Africa across the Mediterranean, taking great risks in their lives. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is to help governments provide international labor standards that protect all workers, including those workers. And so we have tools and guidance that we use to help build the capacity of government institutions to make changes that will really help national workers 
and mm -hmm. refugees. As, as you've worked with these groups and worked with the various governments to help deal with the problems, of course, there's challenges mm -hmm. for the migrants who are moving, who are on the move, for refugees, but also for the host countries. Are there any best practices that come to mind? I, I guess one could say, obviously, in Syria, the best practice would be for the Syrian civil war to stop. That is exactly what's necessary. But are there other best practices that could be implemented or we could think about that would help uh, deal with the plight of the migrant, but also help the host country uh, work with that migrant group to accommodate them more? Well, we have quite a number of, of guidance uh, documents that we use that we help with our capacity building and training. Uh, some of them include skills building. So when refugees uh, are seeking to enter the, the labor market, sometimes they can't because they don't have the language skills or they're not able to, uh, to enter certain sectors of the economy. But the training and skills building work that we do with governments like the refugees, the Syrian refugees in Turkey, really helps them to enter and access the labor market and then have livelihoods for themselves and their families. Other good practices are the avoidance of <coughs> recruitment fees that <coughs> are often uh, put on by labor brokers uh, for people who are trying to get into the labor market. They pay sometimes up to a year's salary for their job. And that's against international labor standards. So putting the right regulations in place to prevent that kind of exploitation is something that we also have guidance on. They're called general principles and operational guidelines for fair recruitment. We adopted through a tripartite process uh, general principles on access of refugees and other forcibly displaced persons to the labor market, which contains a series of programmatic areas that governments can work on to assure the rights of refugees are protected and that they're integrated into the labor market while also providing guidance on how to help create employment for nationals and jobs for refugees. We don't want competition between nationals and refugees. That sets off tensions and creates problems, as you can imagine. And that uh, also leads to discrimination and, and further exploitation. So we want to be able to help communities that are already hosting refugees, but they may have high unemployment uh, issues too. And it is, it's, there are certainly challenges on both sides, <laughs> without a doubt, and we need to work on those. And it sounds like you're certainly looking at the macro picture. You're taking a look at all of the different angles and the issues that affect these folks. I mentioned the Rohingyas as an example, or people fleeing Syria. The, the, your sister agency, the UN High Commission for Refugees, this year I believe is working with 65 million refugees. 15 years ago they were working with 10 million refugees. We can see that's a dramatic increase. Uh, where are some of the what are some of the largest migratory movements right now? The, uh, that I mentioned Rohingyas, are there others, uh, folks coming out of Africa, coming into Europe? But where are some of the others that are taking place? Well, it, 65 million mm -hmm. includes all the displaced people right. as well. Mm -hmm. Internally displaced, displaced across borders from conflict mm -hmm. or natural disaster, and of course the refugees fleeing conflict. These are very complex problems but they also are not the bulk of migrants. In fact, mm -hmm. our estimates show that out of 258 million migrants, 164 million are migrant workers. And most of those enter legal channels or regular pathways to get their jobs. But there are others who have to or are forced to move into these irregular channels that force them into low paying jobs or low skilled mm -hmm. jobs or, or in the informal economy or in precarious employment. Those are situations we want to avoid. We are trying very hard to work with uh, different regional entities because there's so much regional movement. So the bulk of people are not moving across the Mediterranean. The Rohingya is, is a tragedy, of course, that situation. But they are really moving within their own regions. So there's a high movement within Asia from country to country. Within Africa, 80% of that movement in migration is within Africa, not to Europe. We're creating new data in order to help dispel some of the myths that there's this crisis of people moving. In fact, people have been moving since time immemorial, mm -hmm. and people move because they're seeking better livelihoods. So we try to work at the drivers of this migration where it's unwanted and where they don't have to be forced to move, and that also means working on issues of resilience and adaptation for some communities, creating jobs, creating opportunity. But when they do move, they need to be protected.
Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. I'm glad you brought that up because there are, I mentioned 65 million refugees, but really you're talking about a much larger population. And the majority of those migrants go from area to area to area. And many of them, most of them maybe legally, I'm not too sure, or, uh, perhaps illegal, whatever the case might be. But it, it's, we're talking about uh, sort of apples and oranges here <laughs> when you try to compare them. No doubt about that. What, as you look at this situation, do you, do you feel that we're making headway in this? Do you feel that the governments are becoming more responsive? You mentioned you have the tripartite arrangement between the businesses, the labor groups, and governments. Uh, do you feel that they're really more receptive or more sensitive to the issue today than maybe 10 or 15 years ago? Well, certainly it has hit the top of the political agendas <laughs> of many, many is. governments. It's an issue that factors into elections nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there was a lot of, of tension and uh, emotion around the issue. Certainly a lot of uh, public fever and sentiment uh, is being driven by forces that are sometimes mm -hmm. political. But I, I should say that with the Global Compact on Migration, which the UN adopted, 152 member states in December, there was really an approach to find ways to cooperate, for governments to cooperate, to recognize the importance of business, trade unions, other stakeholders, in working together to find solutions. That in fact, in isolation, you can't really address the migration problem. No one country can address it on their own. It really requires cooperation across borders through migration corridors, within regions, and that's what the ILO is trying to do, is to provide areas in which we can work to support member states and employers, workers, and other constituents to address these very complex problems. But working together is the answer. So yes, governments have taken, uh, in many cases, a more positive attitude. We can see that there are still some governments who, uh, or some countries, where the issue is, perhaps not as constructively addressed. Uh, mm -hmm. But we're trying to work with those, uh, those countries that are really seeking to address these problems. Let me give you an example, the Venezuela crisis. A lot of the Latin American countries are hosting hundreds of thousands of these people fleeing Venezuela. And they also have high unemployment. And yet they're working on something called the Quito Declaration, coming together to try to find solutions. And the UN system is coming together as well to help them find solutions. We're working with the UN High Commissioner of Refugees, the International Organization of Migration, FAO, the Organization of American States, to really look at how to create livelihoods that are gonna help everyone. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or Community Access Television Station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a website and you like our shows, please feel free to share them. Your Global Connections TV is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're talking about the, the issue of migration, which is extremely important, important just about every place in the world. And my guest is an expert on this. Ms. Michelle Layton is the chief of the United Nations International Labor Organization Migration Department. We're talking about migration, and uh, before we go too far into it, uh, you've got a very interesting video I think we probably should get into before we lose uh, all the time that we have. But uh, let's go to the video, and we'll come back and talk about it. अब काम पनि हामीलाई के पर्छ हामीलाई त्यो पनि राम्रोसँग फिक्ससँग थाहा थिएन हैन अ धेरै नै डर पनि लागेको थियो हैन अनि नमजा दुखहरु लागिराथे आफ्नो देशबाट छोडेर जाँदा खेरि हामीलाई मेन पावरहरुले कुनै पनि हामीले बुझ्न चाहेको जति भन्नु भएन हैन हामीले कति पयक प्रश्नहरु सोध्दा खेरि नि उहाँहरुले दुई चार र कुराहरु भनेर हामीलाई टाल दिनुहुन्थ्यो अब यति यति पैसा लाग्छ जानु पाइन्छ भन्नु भयो अनि त्यही भएर हामीले त्यति कसैले 15000 कसैले 20000 कसैले 40 पनि तिर्यो हाम्रो आँखाको सामुने त्यसै गरी गरी हामी गएको कति वर्षको अवधि सम्म हामी काम गर्न पर्छ भन्ने कुरो पनि हामीलाई क्लियर थिएन वहीँ पुगेपछि हामीले थाहा पाएको अनि त्यसपछि हामीलाई यहाँबाट चाहिँ 
तोके को तालाब ऐति जून्चा ऐति सैलरी पाइन्चा बहनेरा बहनु बातियो बहनु ना तीन से डॉलर इस तो इस तो बहनु बाको थियो मैं आपु गेरा हमले एक से पास मन डॉलर मते पाइम The Jordan garment sector has doubled in size since 2009. It's really the brands that are now insisting that workers are recruited in a fair way. Factories came to us with their frustration, asked us if we might uh, have some ideas about how that issue can be addressed, and we did. We worked with the factories and with other stakeholders to develop a pilot program to demonstrate that fair recruitment is possible. FAIR is the new integrated program on fair recruitment. It's basically aiming at finding solutions to improve recruitment practices of migrant workers so they do not fall into forced labor situations. It's a really innovative and comprehensive program because it's really looking at the whole supply chains. At Gap Inc, we've always been very focused on what's happening with foreign contract workers and this idea of fair recruitment to ensure that there is a fair approach to bringing people across borders. We're also ensuring that there's no money that it costs the workers for them to go across these borders and take these jobs. For us, this pilot's really important. We're always concerned about deception. We want to make sure workers know where they're going, what factory they'll be working in, what their wages will be, and that everything is clear to them before they leave their countries. There are various risks involved when people recruit from agents or sub-agents. Uh, sometimes the agent does not do their due diligence. To satisfy ourselves and to satisfy our customers, we have to ensure that our employees come at zero cost. Factories want to do the right thing. The program helps us to take ownership of the whole process and becoming responsible for the whole thing by going to the village, by transferring the information directly to the people, telling them what they're going to expect when they come to Jordan. When in terms of how you find solutions, I think it has really to start even before the worker even think of migrating abroad. Because unfortunately there is currently a myriad of intermediaries that are benefiting from unfair recruitment practices. In terms of how we guarantee that no fees have been collected from migrant workers, we've got infrastructure that reaches out right down to the village level to communicate with candidates before they've even left the source country. Fair recruitment is essential if you want to achieve fair competition. And this is the issue we face when you have you know, recruitment agencies not meeting any legal requirements. This is creating unfair competition. This is why we should fight against all these mispractices. If workers are not able to get right and true information, they may be deprived from their rights and they will not be treated as the human beings in the country of destination.
these trainees will receive skill training on garment. In addition to that, pre-departure orientation and soft skill. Providing training is really, really important, particularly for the women. When they learn skill, then they can earn more. Because of their confidence and good skill, they will have good treatment. तालिम ले कर दाम लाए देरे सॉय पूजा हम से जुस्त लात से जोड़न जाना को लागे ची ढक्का भाई राज और ये चीज़ यहाँ आये लो ऑफिस बाट आ जाए और एक ट्रेनिंग आ रही थी रा इना चाय को कुरा रा हमने सब पे जानकारी ली नू पाऊनु पाऊनी बाको ले कर दा त्यो बाको देख दा के रीचे माला एकदम एक खुशी नहीं लग जा फ्रोजेड � जोड़न में आए देखी ना वो तो जॉब सही नहीं एकदम चैलेंजिंग था अने आई तरह मॉल सही नहीं एन्जॉय कर ही रहे थे I'd love to see this project grow and increase. We're looking for industry-wide change. We need everyone to kick in together. I hope that in future the recruitment companies they start to change their attitude and create the fair recruitment environment. We hope that this pilot will lead to the framing, to the definition of what fair and ethical recruitment means in practice. Michelle, that was a really interesting video. As a professional, uh, we're all going to draw our own conclusions from it, but what, what are the two or three most salient points of that as you look at it? Well, I think uh, we can see that there are many uh, migrant workers who unfortunately are um, recruited by labor brokers um, brought into other countries to do jobs that they may not have been signed up to do. We call that contract substitution. The wages may not be the same. I think you saw in the video mm -hmm. some of the examples of that. There's exploitation, um, and particularly women uh, migrant workers who are in migrant domestic work uh, face very serious uh, challenges and often risks of exploitation in the workplace. So. What we're trying to do with our fair recruitment initiative, as the video was showing, is to work with governments to put the right uh, governance systems in place that would help um, these workers enter jobs through regular channels. And that means helping governments in a migration corridor like Nepal and Jordan come up with a bilateral agreement where workers can go safely and securely into jobs where they're not paying labor brokers or recruiters money for their jobs and where they can have a good livelihood and feel proud of the work they're doing. So I think the video shows that this kind of an arrangement isn't just between governments, but also requires business to get involved with fair recruitment. And the businesses who are doing this now are doing it because it's important for their global su supply chains to ensure that they don't have forced labor, trafficked labor, that they are uh, working with international labor standards. Now, in the last 30 seconds we have, the hardest question, what do you see as your major challenge for you and the International Labor Organization as you move forward in trying to provide assistance in this uh, very, very complex issue of migration? I think it's to raise awareness uh, to try and turn the, the narrative on migration around. Migrant mm -hmm. workers contribute to development. They provide essential uh, labor for businesses and economic growth in so many communities around the world. And they, we need to know that, that their work is valued and appreciated. Their rights should be protected. <coughs> we think that there is a need to really help governments and business and trade unions and other stakeholders and communities really find ways to integrate migrant workers so that they have access to equal treatment and equality of opportunity, social protection, and their rights. Mm -hmm. And we think that will benefit not only those communities, and we've seen that in practice, how it benefits those communities, but also the home communities where migrants come from so that they can provide for their families and return with dignity 
and with their rights protected and mm -hmm. also achieve the development potential that everyone, every human being deserves. Mm -hmm. Well, Michelle Layton, it's certainly a very commendable area where you're working, a very important area, and the International Labor Organization covers a wide range of issues. I, uh, I'm just uh, yeah. totally impressed with how many you cover, like human trafficking and uh, climate change refugees, just on across the board. But I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.